defenses. I think that there is a, a cover-up. He crashed uh, following a flying saucer. No government is going to admit that this is going on, the most important event in, in human history. Secrecy and democracy are by definition incompatible. An electorate which is denied information is stripped of its ability to make informed decisions. Yet the vaults of official Washington are bulging with classified factoids and squirreled away dossiers. The so-called black budget from which classified military programs are funded has ballooned to $34 billion a year, larger than the total defense budgets of every other nation except Russia. Yet those programs are completely hidden from the American public and all but a handful of elected officials. Conventional wisdom dictates that secrets can't be kept, that Washington leaks like a sieve, and that every story gets told eventually especially a story as potentially explosive as UFOs. But let me tell you, don't think for a moment that secrets can't be kept. The American taxpayer would have a fit if he knew where some of his tax money was going. Find me a civilian organization that's got a radar. Find me one that's got a fast jet. Find me, you know, all of those things. Detect any kind of uh, electronic countermeasures, equipment, what have you. Satellite detection. Those things belong to the government. So whatever body of good data exists on UFOs, the government has it, only because they're the ones capable of collecting it. There are no secrets better kept, wrote George Bernard Shaw, than those secrets that everybody guesses. Who among us has not heard about an alleged UFO cover-up? The term itself may be a misnomer, because over the years, there have been more than enough UFO leaks, exposés, and whistleblowers to crack any cabal or conspiracy, or so it would seem. But if the right people don't pay attention, and if the right information isn't exposed, if the mainstream major media outlets don't pursue the story, then a non-secret can still be a secret. The books are written. The documents leak out. People talk. But if there isn't a context for the listener to believe that it is anything but science fiction, it's denied. It's the story that cannot be told because no one can believe that it can be true. Some UFO information, documents, and testimony has surfaced. It's the other material, the most persuasive material, which has not. The best evidence has been kept secret successfully for 45 years. You'd be surprised the folk is seeing things and afraid to tell anybody about it. Former Nashville, Tennessee Councilman George Darden has never seen a UFO, but he thought he knew a good deal when he saw one. He was wrong. Darden hoped he could create a few jobs and some tourist income by building, with city funds, a UFO landing pad, sort of a Nashville-style welcome wagon for visitors from the Crab Nebula and beyond. The plan was defeated by a council vote of 27 to 1. Got one vote, which was a start, and that was my vote. Darden then tried to build the project with his own money, but was denied necessary permits by his skeptical, amused colleagues. The newspapers had a lot of fun at his expense, and the councilman even landed himself on the Joan Rivers show. Politically, he was doomed, and so was his idea. People have come right here in front of my house in tour buses because it came on the radio that I had built it in my backyard, which I had not. Darden says he never thought aliens would actually land in Nashville. He merely thought UFOs were a good gimmick. What he didn't know is that the seeds of his demise had been planted decades before by intelligence agencies who secretly plotted to make certain that the media and the public would never take UFOs too seriously and that anyone who did take UFOs seriously would be subjected to ridicule and laughter. And all the way through, you can trace a deliberate pattern of disinformation, deception, uh, the laughter curtain, the ridicule, the debunking, uh, the UFO bashers that came out, uh, come out, there's still a few of them around, and say that anybody involved with UFOs is, is, is a crackpot. And I fault the media for that. They've never, ever taken the time to look at the reality of it, to look at the evidence and talk to the people who have first-hand knowledge. They go out and they'll talk to some poor yo-yo who's wearing a beanie 
with a couple of antennas up there who said, I've been aboard this ship and I went to Venus and I had a love affair with... Well, the media focuses in on that guy, but they won't focus in on a scientist or retired military or a police officer who can tell them firsthand what I've seen and what's happened and what I know. August 1950, Missoula, Montana. A photographer captured movie footage of two silvery disc-shaped objects. The Air Force said it didn't know what the objects were, but that it was possible the craft were Air Force jets. Three years later, a panel of CIA scientists dropped the word possible from the file and declared that the objects were jets, contrary to other evidence. Tremonton, Utah, July 1952. A Navy photographer filmed the formation of flying objects, which he later described as disc-shaped craft. The Air Force and Navy extensively analyzed the film, decided it didn't show planes, balloons, or birds, but didn't say what the objects were. The following year, the same panel of CIA scientists decided, after just a few hours, that the film showed seagulls. Wisconsin, 1952. A formation of UFOs is confirmed on radar. Bermuda, 1954. Again, radar captures images of craft described as UFOs. In the late 40s and early 50s, it became abundantly clear to governments around the world that something unusual really was flying around, something that was seemingly beyond any known technology. Rather than admit their ignorance and confront the issue head on, governments did then what they tend to do today. They lied. I think, in a nutshell, that the government painted itself into a corner about UFOs for very legitimate reasons 45 years ago. And I think the paint's still wet. They didn't know what to do about it. The uh, flying saucers. Uh, Lonnie James spent 26 have, years uh, in the Air Force, mostly as a radar there. operator, and says he and others tracked UFOs on numerous occasions in New Mexico, Texas, and North Dakota. Higher ups would routinely issue lame excuses. We picked up an aircraft, or a blip, I should say, on the radar scope that uh, was acting very strangely, uh, making 90 degree turns on the scope. Uh, we watched it on the height finder first, and it appeared to just rise in height and descend at will. We don't have any idea where they're coming from or what they are, uh, and it's being suppressed by our own government. The individual who told us it was a weather balloon or who told us it was a missile from White Sands had to be an idiot. Total idiot. This former Air Force officer doesn't want his identity revealed but recalls daylight UFO sightings while stationed in Alaska. They appeared to be disks of some kind or another and uh, uh, silver in color. And they were just sitting there, perfectly stationary as the jets proceeded to go after them in different groups, they came back together again at incredible speed. It was just like the blink of an eye. Nobody knew what they were, and they were completely beyond our capability, and we knew, you know, we thought we knew the capabilities of the Soviets at the time. They didn't have anything better than the MiG either. Many people trace the beginning of the modern UFO era to the June 1947 sighting of nine objects by pilot Kenneth Arnold while flying over Washington State. Arnold compared the flight of the objects to a saucer skipping across water, and the term flying saucer was born. In reality, sightings had been taking place for years before Arnold's brief encounter. During the final months of World War II, air crews on both sides of the war frequently encountered strange, almost playful balls of light, which came to be known as Foo Fighters. We thought they might be Nazi secret weapons. The Germans and Japanese thought they were ours. After the war, thousands of so-called ghost rockets were reported over Europe, especially Scandinavia. We suspected they might be Russian weapons. The Russians thought they were ours. UFOs burst onto the American scene in 1947. Kenneth Arnold's was one of nearly 900 sightings that summer. In early 1948, a military pilot, Captain Thomas Mantell, chased a UFO over Kentucky. Mantell radioed back that the object was metallic of tremendous size. A few minutes later, his plane crashed and Mantell was dead. The official explanation was that he was chasing the planet Venus and blacked out for lack of oxygen. 
a metallic Venus didn't wash with many people. Former U.S. Senator and Air Force General Howard Cannon served with Captain Mantell. He went to altitude and he kept trying to go, trying to follow it. He reported in, did report in what he was seeing on the radio, and uh, eventually he just uh, spun out and went in. On the surface, all was calm, but behind the scenes, military officials were greatly concerned. They worried that these unidentified objects might be advanced weapons from an enemy nation, so secret studies were begun. A joint Army-FBI study concluded that the objects were real, not imaginary, that they appeared to be metallic, disc-shaped, manufactured craft capable of great speeds and evasive maneuvers. The existence of this study was kept secret until 1976, 29 years later. The Air Force began its own study centered at Wright-Patterson Air Base in Ohio and dubbed Project Sign. In August of 1948, a top secret evaluation was written based on an analysis of 200 early cases. The Project Sign report concluded, astonishingly, that UFOs were almost certainly interplanetary craft. But when the document was forwarded to Chief of Staff Hoyt Vandenberg, the general disagreed with the conclusion and ordered all copies of the report destroyed. Vandenberg later confided that such a conclusion would have, quote, caused a stampede, meaning widespread panic. Air Force staffers got the message. Any conclusion that UFOs were from somewhere else was unacceptable. They rewrote their report, reached no conclusion, and that report was accepted. Despite the inconclusive bottom line, this report was also kept secret until 1985. That was the last gasp for objective UFO studies. Project Sign was renamed Project Grudge. According to a later congressional report, the primary job of Grudge was to explain all UFO sightings. Even with this mandate, Grudge staffers still found they could not explain 23% of UFO incidents. Their final report chalked up these unknown sightings to, quote, psychological explanations, the first official declaration that people who see flying saucers are crazy. The government has been aware since the late 40s at least that we are dealing with, in many cases, solid vehicles, not from this earth, that they are powered by extremely advanced propulsion systems, and that in some cases um, occupants have been seen. The Air Force went to great lengths to convince the public there was nothing to worry about when tens of thousands of people from the Dakotas to Mexico witnessed a formation of bright UFOs the Pentagon dismissed it as a misidentification of the constellation Orion even though at the time Orion could only have been seen from the other side of the earth. When witnesses reported the apparent landing of a UFO at White Sands, New Mexico, the Air Force determined that what had been seen was the planet Venus, to which one scoffer replied, what an historic occasion, the night Venus landed on the gypsum flats of New Mexico. The joke making the rounds in those days was that for every 200 UFOs sighted, the Air Force could explain away 210. Even less cooperative than the public were the UFOs themselves. Once again, they seemed determined to refute all suggestions that they didn't exist. In 1952, the U.S. was hit by a massive wave of UFO sightings, more than 1,500 separate incidents in all, and many more occurred that weren't reported. Those who question why UFOs haven't landed in Washington, D.C. may be interested in what may rank as the most dramatic UFO incident of all. In July 1952, the nation's capital was buzzed by at least six UFOs on two consecutive weekends. The objects were picked up on numerous civilian and military radars. Fighters were scrambled but were unable to get near the elusive lights. Photos were taken of the objects. Confidential reports hinted the objects may have been from other planets, but the public explanation was the sightings were merely the result of a temperature inversion a thin excuse which didn't convince many people, especially the Pentagon's own radar operators. Even more embarrassing for the Air Force, the DC incidents occurred at the same time as a major no Pentagon news conference called in order to formally dismiss UFOs. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes, as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, 
as meteorological or electronic phenomena or as light aberration. With its public credibility on the wane, the Air Force launched yet another so-called study, Project Blue Book, which was soon inundated with new sighting reports. The first head of Blue Book, Captain Edward Rappelt, somewhat naively attempted to conduct an authentic study, but quickly surmised that his superiors didn't really welcome such an effort. In disgust, he quit, then wrote a book, which told the world that a cover-up was in the works, that UFOs were real, and that they may be extraterrestrial craft. Blue Book stumbled on. From the Air Force point of view and the government point of view, it was primarily a public relations exercise. To the Air Force in those days, UFO reports were just an annoyance. They were, and I asked uh, Hector Quintanilla, who, Major Quintanilla, who was in charge of Blue Book at the time, and he said, it's not our job to do research. It's the scientific community's job. And every time we go to the scientific community, they say there is nothing to UFOs. So what are, who are we to say that, that the scientists are wrong? Despite the pretense of being an objective study, it became abundantly clear in later years that Blue Book was a public relations exercise and that the best, most intriguing UFO cases were never included in Blue Book's files. This memo, issued by an Air Force general in 1969, confirms that UFO cases which affected national security were sent to another program one that remains secret to this day. So the notion, which most people seem to accept, that the only group concerned with UFOs was this wonderful scientific group, Project Blue Book, which it never was anyway, is nonsense as clearly enunciated by an Air Force general told to look over the whole situation. Former Air Force Colonel Wendell Stevens was stationed at Wright-Patterson Air Base when the UFO studies were headquartered there. He was assigned to a special project in Alaska, along with a team of civilians and several planes packed with sophisticated electronic and photographic equipment. And we succeeded in getting uh, and collecting information probably two or three times a week. And some of the cases, of, of the contact cases, were quite spectacular. One of the key pictures that I remember was a time when a, a disc, about a 30-foot diameter disc, got in the slot behind the trailing edge of the, of the, the big wing and ahead of the leading edge of the small wing and only inside of the wingtips within 50 or 60 feet of the fuselage and sat there for two or three minutes and they took pictures with all these cameras and we would package it in a metal box a little locker that was locked and chained to an officer's wrist and flown to washington every night we got one of those none of that has ever been released up next, journalist Brian Gresh investigates the central event in what some have called the Cosmic Watergate. The town of Roswell, New Mexico isn't much different today than it was 45 years ago when it became the unlikely setting for what may rank as the greatest cover-up in history. The old Army airfield has been closed for years, but back in the late 40s, it was home to the world's only atomic bomber wing, the 509th, a point of pride with the locals. Today, as then, much of New Mexico is a virtual military fiefdom. Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque was and is the state's largest employer. Los Alamos Lab and White Sands Missile Base are still key players in the nation's defense establishment. If someone had wanted to get a clear picture of America's military capabilities back in the 40s, New Mexico would have been the place to be. New Mexico in the late 40s and early 50s was not only a hotbed of military activity, but also of UFO sightings. Green fireballs and other unexplained phenomena had been reported over nearly all of the state's top secret military facilities on an ongoing basis, prompting hush-hush studies and evaluations. One secret study, dubbed Project Twinkle, concluded that it was doubtful the phenomenon was of natural origin. One reason? When attempts were made to photograph or record the fireballs, they simply moved to another location, as if they didn't want their pictures taken. Twinkle remained classified for decades. By early July of 47, the public was also becoming aware of the flying saucer mystery. 
Kenneth Arnold's famous sighting had occurred only a few days before, spurring a nationwide sighting spree. But what was seen in the skies over Roswell was different from the other elusive lights. This time, the lights came crashing down. A rancher named Mac Brazel was the first to spot the wreckage in the desert. He first phoned the sheriff, who then called the Army Air Base to report that something had crashed, a decision both would soon regret. The base dispatched intelligence officer, Major Jesse Marcel, to the scene. Marcel and others gathered up some of the strange material and brought it back to Roswell. Foil looking material, uh, about the thickness or thinner than the uh, foil on a package of cigarettes, and that's pretty darn thin. Could not be burned, could not be cut with a pair of scissors. Uh, put on the ground and a pen knife taken and trying to drive it through wouldn't work. Uh, there was no way, it was indestructible for all practical purposes. Lieutenant Walter Hott was the public affairs officer for Roswell at the time the strange metal was found. He recalls being ordered by base commander Colonel William Blanchard to issue a shocking press release. He called and said words to this effect. We've got pieces of what we think is a flying saucer. The release was picked up by newspapers all over the world, and queries about the flying saucer came pouring in. The first phone call I got after that got on the wires and the like was from London, England, fellow calling some newspaper, and I don't remember which one it was. If this is something from outer space, how did Major Marcel know how to fly it? Well, he didn't actually get in it and fly it. He just put the pieces in an aeroplane and flew the aeroplane. But within hours after the initial press release, higher-ups within the Army ordered a new story to be issued. The wreckage wasn't from a flying saucer after all, but rather was part of a weather balloon. A news conference was staged, at which pieces of a shredded weather balloon were put on display. But Major Marcel admitted in later years that the material shown to the reporters wasn't what he brought back from the Brazel Ranch. Marcel said the metal had been spread out over three quarters of a mile at the ranch, far too much material for a weather balloon. And he said some of the pieces contained strange, inscrutable symbols, as if written in an alien language. He reiterated that over and over, that what he had seen was not... I'll have to quote here, not of this earth. He was very, very uh, adamant about it. What Hot didn't know back then was that a second wreckage site, 120 miles from the Brazel Ranch, had also been found, and on the same day. Numerous witnesses, including an archaeology team, say they saw a large crash disk and the bodies of at least four alien creatures. Like the Brazel site, this second location was sealed off by the military and witnesses were told to keep their mouths shut. So when you get such a consistency of input from respectable people, people whose testimony you'd like on your side in the court of law, ask any attorney, you're stuck. What are you going to do from there? These people are telling the truth. It's not one person. It's not 10 people. It's over 100 people. As Friedman reveals in his book, Crash at Corona, Dozens of former military personnel have surfaced over the years who say they saw, handled, or transported either the wreckage, the alien bodies, or both. Bob Shirky, the former assistant operations officer at Roswell Field, is one of them. Colonel Blanchard had called down and said, set up a plane to go to Fort Worth. He said, I want a B-29. And then uh, Colonel Blanchard showed up in a couple of cars and a people come hurrying into the building and <clears throat> he stepped in, Colonel Blanchard stepped into this doorway into the operations office to get out of the hallway. And that's when I said, Colonel Blanchard, you're blocking my view, you know. And I, <laughs> and I peeked over his shoulder as a couple people went by carrying various pieces of metal. And uh, one of them pretty good size, about two by four. Shirky says he knew other people who had knowledge of the wreckage or bodies, including a nurse at the base hospital who claimed to have seen horrid alien carcasses. Shirky has also remained friends with Glenn Dennis, the town mortician. He said to me, did you see the sketches in the paper of the 
humanoids or the bodies? And I said, yes. He says, well, I can tell you that's what they look like. He says, uh, our funeral parlor supplied the caskets for the Air Force to use because we had the contract. And they came in and took all the baby-sized or youth-sized caskets we had. When this crash saucer event took place, the military told him, if you ever talk about what you saw, we will kill you and we will kill your family. While a cover story was being spoon-fed to gullible media, more dramatic steps were taken to ensure that the story of the saucer and bodies would spread no further. Mac Brazel, for instance, was held incommunicado for a week, and when he finally re-emerged, had changed his story about what he found. Sheriff George Wilcox confided in later years that the lives of his family had been threatened by the military unless he kept out of the investigation. His own samples of the strange metal were seized. A Roswell radio station was ordered by the FBI to cease transmission of a story about the crash. But the most effective subterfuge involved the transport of the alleged alien flotsam. Witnesses and records indicate that some of the material was immediately flown to Fort Worth, then on to Wright-Patterson Air Base in Ohio, and perhaps to Washington, D.C. The official Army story is that once the weather balloon mix-up was discovered, plans for transporting the material were canceled altogether, a statement that is demonstrably false. Pilots who flew the material out of Roswell have confirmed the Army was lying. One pilot even claimed to have seen the alien bodies while in flight. This official FBI memo, dated July 8, 1947, clearly indicates that a, quote, disk was being transported from Roswell to Wright-Patterson by a special plane for examination. Wendell Stevens was at Wright-Patterson back then and remembers far more furor than should have been generated by a weather balloon. My immediate superior, who was Colonel Albert Boyd at the time, later became three-star General Albert Boyd and the commander of the Edwards Air Force Base Flight Test Center. He was my immediate superior and he was one of the officers that flew General Twining out to Kirtland Air Force Base on the night of the 3rd of July. More than 200 witnesses in all have now come forward with bits and pieces of information about the New Mexico events, much of it first-hand information. Yet the official files of those agencies charged with investigating UFOs over the years contain virtually nothing about the case, not even files which might discredit it. There is more than enough evidence to suggest that something extraordinary happened in the New Mexican desert back in 1947 and that the military went to great lengths to hide the truth. We have uh, the general who took the call from Washington saying to cover it up. We have the rancher, his son, the people around him, neighbors that he talked to, they come up with a consistent story, descriptions of the not only the wreckage, but how he was treated by the government. We have the media people in the town of Roswell. Some of them are still alive. We have the guy who put out the press release. He's never changed his story in the 14 years since I've been talking to Walter Howe. We have the FBI memo. Even more unsettling is the possibility that there have been other crashes and other cover-ups. UFO researcher Linda Howe says she has been shown documents by military officials which refer to several saucer crashes and recoveries. Bill Moore, who co-authored the first book on the Roswell affair, says he has been shown similar documents. And Timothy Good has heard credible testimony from some of the best-known military leaders of this century. General George Marshall was supposed to have something to do with it. Uh, Marshall became quite forthcoming and admitted that there had been contact with UFOs and that there had been uh, at least three crashes and occupants had been recovered and he went on to say that the occupants of UFOs were hoping to eventually adapt to the atmospheric conditions on this planet. If there have been crashes and recoveries, if alien wreckage and even bodies have been found, where are they? What's being done with the proof? And why can't the public be told? More on these topics is still ahead. With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. 
Retired Marine Corps officer Donald Kehoe is widely regarded as the father of the UFO cover-up theory. In books, magazines, and broadcast appearances during the 50s and 60s, the bulldogish Kehoe became the single most painful dagger in the belly of the Air Force, a relentless crusader who relied on his own military sources to expose Pentagon lies about UFOs, and there were plenty. They are simply following orders to explain away all UFO sightings as quickly as possible when they become public and deny that UFOs really exist. The Air Force went to such extremes in trying to explain away UFOs that it lost credibility even with sympathetic media. In the mid-1960s, the U.S. was engulfed in an intensive two-year UFO wave during which hundreds of thousands of Americans claimed to have seen UFOs. Alan Hynek, Project Blue Book's designated explainer, inadvertently punctuated the mid-60s flap when he announced that UFO sightings by hundreds of Michigan residents were inspired by swamp gas, an excuse which was ridiculed nationally and which prompted calls for a congressional inquiry into UFOs. Under pressure, the Air Force agreed to sponsor what it called an independent scientific study of UFOs. Several universities declined the job, which eventually went to esteemed University of Colorado physicist Dr. Edward Condon. But any hopes for an objective study were dashed even before the project began. Condon himself stated in public that the government should get out of the UFO business and that UFO writers should be horsewhipped. His project coordinator caused his own stir when one of his memos was leaked, stating that the staff would consist of non-believers and that the, quote, trick would be to make the study appear objective. Several staff members resigned, complaining that the results were rigged. Nevertheless, the Condon report predictably concluded that UFOs weren't worth studying, and the Air Force used the Condon report as a reason to cancel Blue Book altogether in 1969. None of the evidence that I have examined would indicate any proof at all that we are being visited by extraterrestrials. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. Heineck, of course, would soon change his mind about Blue Book and about UFOs and would become the most important figure in the history of American ufology. Jacques Vallée was his closest associate. The Scientific Advisory Board of the U.S. Air Force had many opportunities to review the UFO file. They knew that uh, people like Dr. Heineck and I and, and many other scientists were of the opinion that this should be studied and they could have done something. And if they had given a, an opinion to the Secretary of the Air Force that this should be studied, it would have been studied. Instead, everything was swept under the rug. The Air Force contention that UFOs were not a threat to national security was contradicted over and over by the military's own files. A secret order issued in 1960 to all Air Force commanders stated flat out that the Pentagon considers UFOs to be, quote, serious business, and no wonder. UFOs had been seen most often over sensitive nuclear and military installations, including Oak Ridge National Lab, Los Alamos, White Sands, Savannah River, and dozens of other defense installations. Anybody would recognize that if you have a base at which there are stored nuclear weapons, and a vehicle has penetrated your air cover and goes right down the runway, that has national security implications. That kind of sighting is far more interesting to me than some light in the sky meandering along. So, on the one hand, we have this popular impression, repeated as recently as a few months ago by an Air Force spokesman, that there isn't anything that affects national security, and Blue Book was it. Well, that's absolute nonsense, and we've had the records to prove that for a long time. One indication of the Air Force's true view of UFOs was found in this chapter from a military textbook being used at the Air Force Academy in the late 60s. The Air Force was teaching its finest cadets that the UFO phenomenon has been global in nature for 50,000 years, that it is not psychological, that some UFOs appear to be craft controlled by aliens, and that there may be as many as four types of aliens visiting this planet, the Air Force's own words. When word of this chapter leaked to the public, it was pulled from the curriculum. Another indication of how seriously UFOs were taken was the level of secrecy assigned by the Pentagon. And it has been covered up. It was classified higher than the hydrogen bomb back in 1950. 
and it's still classified way, way above top secret. One source for this information was Wilbert Smith, one of Canada's leading scientists during the 1950s. In this formerly top secret memo written for Canada's Department of Transport, Smith revealed that he had had high-level meetings with American scientists concerning UFOs, that flying saucers were real, and that they were classified higher than the H-bomb in the U.S. Smith also indicated that material from crashed saucers had been recovered by the Americans. One of Smith's American contacts was the late Dr. Robert Sarbacher, one of the most respected scientists of this century and a contemporary of Einstein and Oppenheimer. In letters and personal interviews from the early 80s, Sarbacher conceded that he had told Wilbert Smith about recovered saucers and alien bodies, things which, quote, didn't originate on Earth. Sarbacher says he was invited to work on these materials, but never did. He also named several other scientists whom he said were definitely involved, said he'd received briefings on the topic while working at the Pentagon, and that the entire matter was the most classified subject in the U.S. government. Because of Sarbacher's scientific stature, many researchers consider his statements to be the most significant ever made on the UFO topic. The Canadian government wasn't the only one to learn about America's saucer secrets. Former NATO staffer Robert Dean says he read a top secret briefing document prepared for American allies. The conclusion of the study was that if there was a program or a hostile purpose here, it would have all been over. They could fly rings around us. They made fools of us in the air. They played games with us on the ground. Case after case after case. There is a collaboration on top, above top secret information on this subject between, say, the United States, Great Britain to a certain extent, to a certain extent, uh, Canada, um, Australia. But this is, this is to a limited extent. I don't think um, the United States has revealed everything it knows to other governments. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Many governments haven't the faintest idea what's going on. They have no need to know, and they haven't been filled in. Why would world governments maintain two attitudes about UFOs, a great concern in private, but ridicule and debunking in public? The answer can be traced to the early 50s. What is the flying saucer? What do people see and sometimes photograph? What's behind the daily reports of aerial phenomena in the nation's press? I think it was from outer space. But friendly. The great UFO wave of 1952 had attracted the attention of the CIA, which was concerned that a foreign power might be able to exploit America's saucer craze. So a panel of scientists was convened to consider UFOs, the so-called Robertson Panel. Members spent a total of 12 hours over three days reviewing the UFO evidence and concluded there was nothing to worry about. UFOs were not a threat to national security. However, the continued reporting of UFOs could be a threat, the panel said, and it recommended an official policy of debunking so that flying saucers would be stripped of their aura of mystery. The Robertson panel also recommended that UFO groups and researchers should be monitored. Armed with these recommendations, the CIA and military intelligence agencies swung into action with a plan that is still being carried out. Ridicule those who see UFOs. Spy on people who research UFOs. Confuse the public with disinformation. For example, plans were drafted to enlist the aid of Walt Disney in belittling the UFO mystery. Popular TV host Arthur Godfrey was also to be recruited. CIA staffers so thoroughly infiltrated the leading UFO organizations of the day that most of them collapsed from within. Attempts were made in the U.S. and other countries to build terrestrial flying saucers, which, if any of them had really worked, would have further confused the public. You know, there are lots of games being played behind the phenomenon itself. In other words, there is a real phenomenon. But there may be, and here we're talking about the third level, the sociological level. Um, if you could make people expect aliens, you could manipulate public opinion. High-profile people who take an interest in UFOs, people like former Nashville Councilman George Darden, end up as targets of scorn and laughter. Others, like Linda Howe and Bill Moore, find themselves the targets of government surveillance. The FBI, for instance, has been unwilling to let Moore see the dossier it's compiled on his UFO activities. And some have been warned. I have been warned by some people that uh, they're paying close attention to you, Stan. And I try to be careful what I do and what I say. 
and a lot of people have spilled the beans, but they have been either popularly discredited, so the story doesn't travel. Some have uh, been incarcerated in one way or another. Uh, some in, 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 in mental institutions. Nobody else believes that this is going on. They can tell their neighbors and the neighbors laugh at them, but it is going on and it works and there's only a few that, that jump the fence and those few are discredited and, and the word doesn't travel too far. Concerning UFOs. Clifford Stone had a spotless military record until the summer of 1986 when his army commanders found out he was writing a book about UFOs. From that point on, Stone says, his life became a living nightmare. If you have an interest in UFOs and you're writing Freedom of Information Act request and writing various senators, then there has to be something wrong with you. So they set me up for a mental health evaluation. Upon my return from seeing the legal advisor, they had already moved everything out of my office. I had been relieved of duty. They set up an office for me down in the basement. I was not to have any contact with any of the uh, other cadre. As a matter of fact, the other cadre were scared that if they were talk seen talking to me, that they would be in trouble. They were talking court-martial. Stone says he developed several high-level military sources who convinced him the cover-up is real. My executive officer who started all this called me in. He told me, he says, what difference does it make to you if we have 50 captured saucers? I, my response to him was, and I remember this to this day, sir, you have the luxury of not knowing the truth. Unfortunately, I do not share that same luxury. People with far more clout than Cliff Stone have also been thwarted in their efforts to find out what the military knows about UFOs. During his campaign for president, Jimmy Carter vowed to open all UFO files if he were elected. News articles hinted that Carter was preparing to make an unsettling announcement about UFOs, but it never happened, and to this day, he declines to say why. Senator Barry Goldwater, a former Air Force general who also served as chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, would presumably have the power and the clearance to see anything in the military's arsenal. But when Goldwater asked to see the so-called Blue Room, where UFO material is supposedly stored during a visit to Wright-Patterson Air Base in Ohio, he was told by General Curtis LeMay that it was none of his business and he should never ask again. Former Nevada Senator Howard Cannon is one of Goldwater's closest friends and says he and Goldwater discussed UFOs and the Blue Room several times. What Barry wanted to do is get in and, and find out what did they have? What could they say when you say he was turned down? I'm sure that uh, had I gone to them and said I'd like to go in there, what's the useful purpose? You know. Uh, we couldn't come out and talk about that sort of thing and say, uh, well, here's what we saw. Uh, first place, uh, somebody would say we were lying, and uh, it, it would serve no useful purpose, I think. Cannon, who also was an Air Force general, thinks Congress would have been told if crashed saucers had ever been recovered, but concedes that such secrets could be kept from Congress and the public. Well, they've kept some <laughs> pretty good secrets over a period of time. And, uh, so I'd have to say that uh, I, I'd have to believe that, that, that secrets like that could be kept. Getting copies of government UFO documents can also be a daunting task in spite of the Freedom of Information Act. Simply put, if the government doesn't want you to see a file, you won't. There's no question that agencies of the United States government have been withholding on a regular <laughs> clear-cut basis a data about flying saucers, among them the CIA and the National Security Agency. Today, 99.9% .9 of all UFO government documents are available in the National Archives. UFO debunkers like Phil Klass somewhat naively assume that the government has no interest in hiding UFO files because there's nothing in them. That view is not borne out by experience. The FBI, for instance, vigorously and repeatedly denied having any UFO files or any interest in the subject. But when the Freedom of Information Act was passed, the G-men reluctantly coughed up 2,000 pages of UFO documents, dating back to the very beginning of the modern UFO era. 
right to the CIA to ask for its UFO files, and you'll be told the agency hasn't collected UFO information since the 50s. Yet official documents from the 70s and beyond refer to CIA UFO experts, CIA UFO studies, and the CIA monitoring the UFO situation. Military officials have also been caught telling UFO lies. Both the Air Force and the RAND Corporation denied any knowledge of a secret UFO study commissioned by the Pentagon. Yet, here it is. The RAND study acknowledged the reality of UFOs and said that a solution to the UFO mystery was a matter of the highest urgency. The National Security Agency, the CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, FBI, many other agencies are withholding thousands of pages of documents on UFOs in the interest of national security. They admit that. For decades now, since the 1940s, all those agencies I've just referred to have denied any sort of serious involvement in UFO research. So they've been lying to us about that. In addition to lying about the existence of UFO documents, government agencies routinely censor those UFO files which they are forced to release. The trouble is, as you start to go through this document, you rather quickly find that a lot of it isn't really there. And I won't stop because you'll see how many pages are really full of good information. Trying to get files declassified can be all but impossible. Appeals to the FBI, for example, can drag on for three to four years. The Department of Energy says it could take up to seven years to obtain some of its sensitive UFO-related material. The National Archives has a backlog of 325 million documents awaiting declassification. Agencies are able to hide behind this log jam, using it as an excuse to withhold or stall the release of UFO information. More disturbing than censorship, false denials, and stall tactics is government-sanctioned disinformation, which seemingly flows back to the CIA's Robertson panel. A recommendation that UFOs be demystified inspired intelligence agencies to muddy the flying saucer waters. Today, there are even officially published rules for how deception programs should be carried out in order to provide cover stories for secret military projects. Disinformation is a diversion away from the truth. Our method of protecting information is essentially to dilute it with so much garbage that it is extremely difficult for an outsider without access to know what's good and what isn't. Bill Moore should know all about disinformation efforts. He admits that he was part of one in the 1980s, working hand in hand with Air Force intelligence in a scheme to discredit a UFO researcher, a man who subsequently suffered a mental breakdown. Moore defends his motives. My involvement was only with the motive of learning how the process worked, who was involved with it, and ultimately, if I could, what was behind it. Why is the government doing this kind of thing? I never did quite learn why, but I did learn who, and I learned a great deal about how. Moore is also at the center of what many consider to be the ultimate UFO deception, the MJ-12 affair. A copy of the so-called MJ-12 document was sent anonymously to Bill Moore's associate. It purports to be a briefing paper prepared for President Eisenhower, explaining that crashed saucers and alien bodies have been recovered and that a secret organization of a dozen scientists and officials had been appointed to study and control all UFO material, MJ-12. Most UFO researchers consider the MJ-12 document to be a fake. The Air Force has finally issued a formal statement saying the document is not genuine. However, the details inside the paper aren't so easily dismissed. More than 30 different pieces of information, little details, that we didn't know before we got the documents, which were received in December 1984, but turned out to be true. And it really boggles the mind how somebody could have known those things. If they're real, then they speak for themselves. If they're not real, then they are an extremely elaborate and sophisticated hoax, which, in my opinion, can only have been created by someone inside the government because there are things in those documents that weren't in the public domain at the time the documents came to us.
Stan Friedman spent several months and thousands of dollars trying to verify the MJ-12 paper. He says he found nothing which would automatically discredit it and remains convinced that MJ-12, or something like it, is very real. But I'm convinced that there is such a group, and if there isn't, we've made a terrible mistake. Because presidents and intelligence agencies need a group like that. Jacques Vallée was one of the first writers to suggest that the government might be deeply involved in UFO disinformation. Today, he says, there is ample evidence that such programs continue. What intrigued me was that those people had linked to psychological warfare activities of the military, which opens the way to the, the speculation that perhaps the belief in UFOs can be manipulated as part of psychological warfare exercises. The long and winding paper trail clearly shows that our government in its various forms spies on UFO researchers, infiltrates UFO groups, lies about UFO documents, censors UFO files, threatens UFO witnesses, and weaves vast and elaborate UFO deception programs aimed at confusing and misleading the American public and the rest of the world. The government is acting in the view of many like a frightened child, afraid to face the truth. What are they afraid of, and why can't we be told? More on that as we continue. In the United States, any person who comes into contact with extraterrestrial beings or material can be locked up for an indefinite period without so much as a hearing. Family members could also be incarcerated and all property could be seized based on an obscure rule buried in NASA regulations. Ostensibly, the law was meant to allow for the quarantine of astronauts, but its verbiage could be applied to any American citizen. The law typifies NASA's touchiness concerning ETs and UFOs. The space agency simply doesn't want to talk about such subjects. In 1977, for example, President Jimmy Carter asked NASA to resume studying UFOs because there had been so many inquiries from the public. NASA politely but firmly said, no thanks. The now canceled SETI program, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, was renamed by NASA in part because the space agency didn't want people to say it was looking for little green men, even though that's pretty much what it was doing. I think that there is a, a cover-up of sorts. Uh, I, I don't know to what degree it is because, of course, it's very hard to tell what's information and what's disinformation. As if it were Former cable. astronaut Brian O'Leary yeah, has had first-hand experience with NASA's alien paranoia. Really Dr. O'Leary was recruited by NASA for a manned mission to Mars, primarily because of his extensive writings about the Red Planet. But when O'Leary took an interest in the so-called face on Mars and suggested it might even be the remnant of an ancient civilization, he encountered stiff opposition. I did an optical study of the face on Mars and um, it took me four years to publish the paper. It was finally published in the journal of the British Interplanetary Society. The first few attempts to publish it were turned down flat and the reviewers made such comments as like, you know, Dr. O'Leary shouldn't spend one microsecond of his time uh, inquiring into something so ridiculous and so absurd. But the mainstream scientists, when they start to look at these pictures, uh, in fact, I know the person that first discovered them. Uh, his name is Toby Owen. He's, he's a co colleague of mine in planetary science. And he and some of the other people, when they started looking at the pictures, there was kind of a nervous laughter, almost like a, a teenager looking at pornography, you know, saying, that looks like a face. And, but then when it comes time to go public, uh, you, you, you have to be conservative or else you're gonna, you, you might just blow your whole credibility. In 1993, NASA launched the ill-fated Mars Observer for the purpose of thoroughly photographing the Martian surface. Despite intense public interest in the face and surrounding features, NASA had to be dragged, kicking and screaming, into an agreement that the face region would be photographed. Even then, NASA said it may or may not release any such photos to the public, most likely because it didn't want to add fuel to the ET fire a point made moot when the Mars Observer allegedly disappeared. Researcher Don Ecker is convinced that NASA has been taken over by the military. In fact, that NASA over the last couple of years have been slowly but surely clearing out their civilian research personnel and have been bringing in retired military personnel. What this suggests is, is that NASA is going black. Journalist Ecker points to a 1991 mission of the Space Shuttle Discovery, STS-48, as an example of NASA's participation in a cover-up. This footage was taped from NASA's own satellite signals. 
it shows several anomalous objects floating in space near the shuttle. Objects which NASA says were ice crystals, space debris, or both. But analysis by some of NASA's own consultants cast serious doubt on these excuses. At one point, the footage clearly shows an object make a radical shift in direction in apparent response to a flash of light emanating from the shuttle. Here's the sequence again. Notice two other objects streaking across space at incredible speeds. Self-propelled ice crystals, or are they something unexplainable? These objects, in fact, were not ice, were some type of manufactured vehicle, and they demonstrated a propulsion system that we presently on Earth either are not aware of, or if, if there are elements within the government that is aware of it, they're keeping it under wraps. To some, this sequence of events suggests a hostile inner space encounter between a U.S. space shuttle and UFOs. To others, it's another in a long string of inconsequential sightings of space junk. The question of whether American astronauts have seen UFOs was settled long ago, even though no astronauts, current or former, are willing to talk about the subject today. Of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, at least three reportedly saw anomalous objects. John Glenn saw sparkling fireflies dancing around his capsule. The late Deke Slayton said he repeatedly circled a stationary UFO while piloting a fighter plane. And Gordon Cooper was so certain that the craft he witnessed several times while flying over Europe were of extraterrestrial origin that he wrote a letter stating his opinion to the United Nations. Cooper has since recanted his statement, but refuses to answer any questions about what he saw or why he changed his mind. In fact, none of the astronauts who supposedly saw anomalous objects were willing to respond to inquiries, including astronauts Frank Borman and James Lovell, who snapped this photo of two luminous objects from space, or James McDivitt, who confided in friends about his own UFO sighting while in orbit. They can't even tell their spouses. and. Um... I either get no answers or I get a very emotional response, uh, almost an embarrassment that, you know, that, that I even ask the question. It's kind of ironic. It's one of these catch-22 situations. If you know, you can't tell. If you don't know, you don't know anyway. UFOs have reportedly been monitoring human technology for decades, perhaps centuries. They followed our planes and experimental vehicles, have been spotted adjacent to rocket and missile tests, and have done the same all over the world. What I have been told off the record by certain former members of the American space effort was that not only have there been UFOs encountered in many space flights and with the Russians, but that the Americans and the former Soviet Union had a very close covert relationship working hand in hand in the pursuit of the overall UFO phenomenon. Under communism, Soviet leaders publicly scoffed at UFO reports, suggesting the whole matter was a capitalist plot. At the same time, the Russians sometimes used UFOs for their own propaganda purposes. They had launch sites that were secret. And when they launched a rocket, they encouraged the people in the area to believe that what they had seen in the sky was a flying saucer. They actually planted those stories. I think we've done the same thing. But the Russian military clearly knew that UFOs were real. Hidden in the archives of the Ministry of Defense is solid evidence of Russian UFO encounters on Earth and in space. What's more, the Russian government knows that the American government knows. Because the Soviets got a jump on the U.S. in the space race, they also had the first outer space UFO sightings. Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, reportedly saw UFOs during his flight but said he was not permitted to talk about it. The second Russian in space not only saw UFOs, but filmed them. One frame of that film, showing several UFOs dancing around the capsule, was published in a Soviet magazine years later. Scientist Ramily Avramenko, one of the chief designers of Russia's Star Wars program, says the Soviet government knew UFOs were from somewhere else since day one of the space race. At that time, satellites in space were easily countable. 
but we also saw vehicles whose technical characteristics we cannot match even now. We saw tens of these in 1959. Surely the existence of these vehicles caused problems for the U.S. defense systems, because you are faced with this information as well. These still classified Ministry of Defense documents, never before seen in public, reveal that Russian spies learned a great deal about UFO encounters involving American astronauts. The Russians are convinced there were several direct encounters with UFOs while American astronauts were on the moon, and that the Americans haven't returned to the moon because we were told to stay away. Several high-ranking military and scientific sources confirm that the Russians knew much about the ongoing UFO cover-up in America. Retired Army Colonel Boris Sokolov was in charge of the Soviet's secret UFO projects for 10 years and says he knew that the U.S. military had constructed 40 UFO listening posts as part of its UFO research. I think America could learn something. I mean, after we gave lessons to the Russians for 40 years about freedom of, uh, and liberty and so on, and uh, now they're publishing a lot of stuff. I, I doubt it that they're publishing everything they have, but at least they are releasing a lot of material, and uh, our military doesn't seem to have changed too much their attitude. The big question about the UFO cover-up remains. Why? Some final thoughts on that are just ahead. When is a secret not a secret? When everyone has heard it, but few pay attention. The UFO cover-up has been so well documented over so many years that it has seemingly become part of our popular mythology. It is not a myth. The government's own secret studies concluded decades ago that UFOs were real. Those studies were suppressed, then replaced by public relations shams. Schemes were hatched to ridicule the topic, to confuse the public, to hide the real information. An extensive paper trail reveals that many people had direct knowledge of the cover-up and that many others tried to get the information but were refused. Government agencies routinely lie about what they know. Other agencies issue ridiculous cover stories and disinformation. Scores of witnesses recall what may be the most important event in history. The government says nothing. Other witnesses, including some of our modern-day heroes, have seen the proof with their own eyes, but are ordered to keep quiet. Good people are threatened and harassed to maintain this non-secret secret. The best evidence makes it abundantly, indisputably clear that someone, somewhere, has a lot more information than the rest of us. I think that there are people who must have, people in Washington and elsewhere, must have a building full of data that I think the scientific community should have. Data that comes from radar, from sensors on Earth, from sensors in the ocean, and from sensors in space. There is a, uh, a cover-up in the sense that they are keeping the data to themselves. And I think the, the greatest secret may be that nobody has any idea what those objects are. It almost seems as if the government is toying with us. Wright-Patterson Air Base is widely thought to have been the home to recovered alien technology. On the emblem for the base's aptly named Foreign Technology Division is this strange symbol. A joke on the public? George Adamski, the original contactee whose claims about visiting Venus have been largely discredited, was able to travel all over the world to deliver specious lectures with the help of a special high-level passport. Who gave it to him? President Ronald Reagan, who delivered five public speeches about a possible threat from outer space, held a special White House screening of the movie E.T. and afterward whispered in the ear of director Steven Spielberg. When the showing was over, Reagan got up, put his hand on Steve's shoulders, and you know, fewer than six people in this room know the whole story. We can't say how many people, if any, know the full story, but certainly there have been many who know more than the rest of us, including some of the most trusted personalities of this century. Scientists like Herman Oberth, the father of modern rocketry, who said that UFOs are from outer space and that contact had been established. Or his colleague, Werner von Braun, who hinted that closer contact with an alien intelligence was imminent. Or General Douglas MacArthur, who predicted that our next great war would be an interplanetary war. Or General George Marshall, 
who also said contact had been made and that UFOs could wipe us out if they wished. Or Admiral Roscoe Hillencoder, first director of the CIA, who joined a UFO group after leaving government and who said that the next step is up to the aliens. Or famed scientist Robert Sarbacher, who told colleagues he was invited to work on recovered alien material and that the matter is the most classified subject in the government. Or Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and Winston Churchill, each of whom ordered secret UFO studies in their respective nations. Or future President Gerald Ford, who called for congressional hearings so that Americans could learn the truth about UFOs or President Jimmy Carter, who saw his own UFO and who wanted to open all government UFO files, but didn't or couldn't. Or Senator Barry Goldwater, who was denied access to UFO information, but who later wrote that a plan was in the works to let the public know the full story. So what is this plan, and when do we get to see it? The solution to avoiding acculturation would be one of indoctrination. And my research has exposed a great deal of evidence, a total preponderance of evidence that clearly suggests that we've been on that path. The government has been supplying us with leaked information, if you will. There's substantial evidence of use of subliminal media. Exler is one of many UFO researchers who suspects that the public is being slowly programmed through advertising, TV shows, movies, and other media to accept the alien reality. If such a plan isn't in the works, perhaps there should be one. This 1960 study prepared by the Brookings Institute for NASA predicted that confirmed contact with a more advanced alien civilization would lead to the collapse and disintegration of human culture and institutions. In other words, total chaos. The study suggested that only a gradual indoctrination program could prevent this. Whether or not such a program was ever implemented, the effect has been the same. People seem ready. So you fear the unknown. If you know all about UFOs, uh, the fact they're here, uh, there's going to be no panic. That's an excuse they've used since the Orson Welles uh, radio, Mercury Radio program in 1938. The people did panic. Uh, we are far more sophisticated than that. The public at large may be ready, but select groups may not. Some researchers are convinced that the cover-up persists because of its potential effects on religion. The first thing that would happen would be you'd have 40 million uh, right-wing fundamentalist Christians climbing the walls, and then you'd have virtually every other opposition politician screaming in, in holy terror. Uh, you'd, have, you'd have absolute chaos. Others think the cover-up is maintained because of a military mindset among those who control the information. Under the guise of national security, many things were hidden and many things today are still being hidden because there is a fear among certain individuals and very covert people that it is not good for the national uh, security of this country for the citizens to understand it. If alien technology has been recovered by the government, it could represent the ultimate weapon system, a system that no government would want to see in the hands of another. In the Nevada desert, for example, a top secret, highly secure military base known as Area 51 is where witnesses and informed sources have repeatedly seen flying saucers, which they say are of alien origin. I saw eight other ones, yeah. Former government scientist Bob Lazar says the disks are being studied so that their military potential can be exploited. The field that's generated will disable electronic equipment. It, 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 could be, it could absolutely be the ultimate weapon there is. I'm convinced that we do have recovered craft and that the propulsion system associated with those craft is so sensitive that it is re related to defense. And quite obviously, that has to be um, covered up. Tim Good agrees that national security is one reason why governments won't talk about recovered disks, and he agrees that such technology has likely been studied at Area 51. But he also sees other reasons for the government's reluctance. Well, I think now something like 3,500 pilots have reported sightings of UFOs now, um, military and civilian pilots. I've spoken to a number of pilots who've had near collisions with UFOs. If it were to be revealed that there have been quite a number of near collisions and that in some cases aircraft have even disappeared. I've, in, in Above Top Secret, I've cited um, at least two instances where aircraft have disappeared shortly after UFOs have been seen in the vicinity or reported by the pilot. 
that's not the sort of information that governments want to let out to the public. I mean, people would be wary about flying anymore. Bob Dean thinks it would be difficult for the government to make a limited announcement because any official acknowledgement would open a floodgate of sources. We've got astronauts, top military people, who are willing to tell us in an open forum what they've seen and what they've experienced if they can be guaranteed that their careers and their families are not going to be in danger. And I said before that if that announcement were made or something to that effect that I would rather be in the liquor business than the real estate business. <laughs> Author and researcher Bud Hopkins is convinced that so-called alien abductions are at the heart of the cover-up because they seemingly happen so often and there doesn't seem to be anything anyone can do to stop them. These people or creatures or whatever they are are here and doing what they want to with a population able to control their memories float them out of their houses or their cars or whatever uh, do physical examinations take samples and send them back and there's nothing the government can do about it can you imagine any government leader standing up and admitting that publicly it would be uh, an absolute abdication of that sense of control that all politicians like to have nobody will do that Stan Friedman maintains that people could handle the truth without widespread panic, but he also believes the effects would be profound. I mean, some of the things that would happen, I suppose, church attendance, mental hospital admissions would go up, stock market would go down. But I think the biggest thing that would happen, based on 600 college lectures, a lot of young people out there, is that there'd be an immediate push on the part of the younger generation, which was never alive when there wasn't a space program, interestingly enough, for a whole new view of ourselves instead of as uh, Americans, Russians, Chinese, Cubans, Ghanaians, whatever, as Earthlings. Because obviously from an alien viewpoint, we are all Earthlings. There's no government on this planet that wants that. Interestingly enough, NASA has already drafted a list of protocols to be followed in the event that contact with aliens is ever publicly confirmed. Even with a game plan to follow, any such announcement would be dicey business. Let's say that the president decided to make an announcement. This is, if he made it today, this is what I think that uh, he would say. Ladies and gentlemen, this extraterrestrial spacecraft are operating in our environment. They can fly circles around the best aircraft we have in flight. Where they come from, we do not know. Who is in them, we do not know. We do know they can paralyze anybody they want to at will, take them into their craft. We do not know if they represent a threat. But we know that they're here and there isn't a damn thing we can do about it. Thank you and good night. <laughs> if the government can't issue a declaration, what about the visitors themselves? Although it seems as if their presence has become more obvious over the past few decades, there apparently has been no overt attempt at blowing the lid off the cover-up. It's quite obvious that the secrecy doesn't even originate with the government. Uh, why don't the visitors land on the White House lawn and make themselves public? Why didn't they do that this morning? The reason is they themselves are the architects of the secrecy. I get the feeling that they don't want us to solve this feeling. I get the feeling that they want to protect the secrecy program. I get the feeling that they don't like what is happening in our society in terms of learning about them. If the visitors won't end the secrecy, and if the government can't, the burden for uncovering the truth falls to the public. The UFO question isn't something which belongs solely in the domain of tabloids, talk shows, or movies of the week. We all have a stake in the answer. I think the only hope for a decent future for this planet is an earthling orientation. The easiest way to get it is to recognize that somebody's coming here, and to them, we are all earthlings, like it or not.